All right, with that, we'll turn it over to our moderator for panel one, our showcase host, Minnesota, Leanne Buck. Uh, thank you, Anne. And I wanna make sure I'm on, but here we go. So again, we're excited to kind of break it down. So building off of what Larry had talked about, the collaborative effort at a national level, and then looking at a 20 state regional level, it's nice now to kind of transition and give you a state perspective of how we're doing things that ultimately have impacts at the local soil and water conservation district and community level. So today we, I'm happy to introduce, I'm honored. Uh, we have, uh, we're kind of looking at two different sections here and we're bundling up, this is how well they coordinate. They're putting their uh, package and their messaging together. So at this time, we're gonna be talking about conservation districts and forestry and fire in Minnesota. And we have from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, John Carlson, who is their private forest management coordinator and Casey McCoy, fire prevention supervisor, as well as incorporating that, uh, obviously, as we mentioned, the land of 10,000 lakes, how conservation districts in Minnesota use water resources to manage our forested landscape and we will be having with the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources. Nat in Minnesota for other states is our state conservation agency. And that is Dan Stewart, who is a forested landscape planning coordinator. So welcome John, Casey and Dan, and I'll let you guys take it away. Great, thank you, Leanne, appreciate that introduction. Um, first thing here, I'm going to just quick get my uh, screen sharing here before I get started. And let me know when that is looking okay. Nice fish. <laughs> You're seeing the final slide right away. <laughs> Oil in it. Okay, are you able to see, are you seeing my presentation right now with nothing else? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's not on the presentation mode, but I've got to. Let's see, I gotta, I gotta switch. I got two screens up here and sometimes that does, it's not intuitive how to, to share the correct one here. So I'm gonna share screen two. I think dual monitors are supposed to make this simple and it's, instead it complicates it. My apologies. Just hit slideshow at the top and then hit beginning, it'll go to the top. Yeah, you should be good from here. Yeah, when I hit pre present mode, it, it pops so up. Just, monitor. Yeah, just, yeah, just do slideshow yeah. at the top. Where it says slideshow, hit slideshow. I mean presentation mode? Yeah, just hit slideshow. Yeah, that's what I got here. I got to share it a different way here. In fact, I'm just going to unplug my other monitor and that's going to take care of it. I'm almost there. There you go. How are we doing? Sorry about that. Um, it's not like I haven't been doing this for the last year. So thank you, Leanne, for that uh, introduction. Um, so yeah, my name is John Carlson. I work, uh, I'm the private forest management coordinator for DNR Forestry. Um, I'm replacing uh, Gary Michael, who was originally going to do this. He's my supervisor. He was unable to make it today, so I'm stepping in for him. And uh, like Leanne mentioned, I'm also joined with Casey McCoy and Stewart. Um, and thanks, Anne, for the, the opportunity and all the, the organizers here today for this opportunity for us to, to present this to you. So thank you again for that. Um, and all three of us work with conservation districts here in Minnesota in a variety of ways. Um, so I'm going to kind of kind of build some context, give you an idea of what the landscape is like here in Minnesota, what some of those opportunities are. Um, Casey's going to give you 
um, some background on, on the fire prevention aspect of programs here in Minnesota. And then Dan is going to go over some of the specifics on you know, how we're working with districts here um, in Minnesota on a conservation scale uh, to get more work done. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so first here to start, um, so just kind of want to just build a little context here and, and kind of give you an idea how we're linking in here with um, the national goals from the national strategy that we um, just heard about. Um, so primarily our districts here in Minnesota are going to be working with, um, you know, goal one and goal two on the national goal. Um, it, that kind of sets up, you know, a safe and effective fire response. You know, so primarily our efforts are going to be, be focusing on those, you know, the second priority which is gonna be dealing with vegetation and fuels management, but it also is gonna entail, you know, working on um, the other one as well. Um, and so in our approach here is kind of, you know, our key approach is dealing all with, with our forest land on a, on a landscape scale, on a watershed scale. And in, in, the, in the benefits come, you know, indirectly will also benefit um, wildfire as well, just to provide some additional context here in Minnesota, we have over 200,000 private landowners. So imagine working with 200,000 different CEOs. I mean, it's complicated. Everyone has different goals. Everyone has different priorities for their land. So finding ways to be able to engage them is definitely challenging. And you know, and so, you know, how do we do that? You know, what are some, what, what do we do there? Um, well, here, what we're trying to do here, we've kind of developed this methodology over the last 10 years um, to engage our conservation districts using you know, water as the key to, um, water quality as the key driver, you know, to, to forest and forest management. So Dan's gonna kind of, you know, talk about that here in a little bit and talk about how these, you know, the conservation districts play a key role in that effort. Um, before we get into that though, first I'm gonna turn it over here to Casey and uh, Casey is going to talk about um, our fire prevention programs. Go ahead, Casey. Hey, good morning. Um, everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Um, thank well. you. Um, so, um, again, my name is Casey McCoy. I'm the fire prevention supervisor and to talk a little bit about uh, one of my favorite things, wildfire. Um, so you can see from the slide here, uh, Minnesota has a long history of wildfire going back to the Hinckley fire in 1894 uh, was really kind of a, um, uh, a, a kickoff to a number of things that happened in the state of Minnesota. Uh, the Hinckley fire burned about 350,000 acres. Uh, it consumed uh, the entire community of Hinkley, along with five other communities around it, uh, and it killed, I want to say, about 400 people in that fire. Uh, just a little while later, you had the Cloquet Moose Lake Fire, another well-known fire in Minnesota in 1918. Uh, that one killed more than 450 people and burned almost a million acres. I think the only fire uh, nationally known is the Peshtigo Fire in Wisconsin that, it, that exceeds that level of death on fire. So we have uh, a long history of that and these fires along with others uh, led to the appointment in about 1895 of C.C. Andrews. General C.C. Andrews is the first state fire ward in Minnesota. Um, four years later, uh, the legislature created the state's first forestry board in 1899 and in 1911 the uh, uh, state legislature then created the Minnesota Forest Service, and that organization is essentially the uh, the precursor of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. So fire prevention, fire suppression uh, has a long history and has played a big role in shaping conservation agencies in Minnesota for, for a number of years. Um, I think fire will continue to shape conservation work in Minnesota, and I think uh, into the future, I think uh, conservation districts can be an important partner in, in how we move forward. Um, next slide, John. So you can see here, we've got a couple different maps showing up here. Uh, someone earlier mentioned how diverse uh, the area is and Minnesota is no exception to that. Uh, we're located in the center of the continent, more or less. We have a, uh, what maybe a long cold winter would be a way to <laughs> describe uh, our winters here in Minnesota. And typically that limits our fire season a number of years to a, a fairly short two to three month window uh, between March and April. And you can see in the map on the right, you can see as fires, this is a 10 year, uh, snapshot of fires that fill in every year from 2008 to 2018. Um, the landscape, as you can see from the map on the left, uh, varies quite a bit. I think it was mentioned earlier as well. So 
Uh, prairies dominate the south and the west side of the state. And as you move east, uh, you run into uh, a transition to deciduous forest a lot of times. And as you continue further east, you run into uh, a more mixed forest. But to some extent, I think uh, Minnesota landscapes are generally all fire adapted or all fire dependent, uh, regardless of what you're looking at. And the interesting thing I, I the interesting thing, one interesting thing to me about this map is you can see the number of landscapes that Minnesota shares with all the other states in the Northeast 20 states. Um, so on fire trends themselves, let's compare with uh, some of the other major regions of the country. Uh, the numbers that we pulled, uh, a five-year period from 2008 to 12, the Northeast area averaged uh, 21,083 wildfires every year, burning an average of about 136,000 acres annually. Uh, compared to the South for that same area, or that same time frame rather, uh, they averaged 38,582 wildfires annually. They have a pretty big fire load in the South and about 1.7 million acres or about 12 times more acres. Uh, the same period in the West, 23,000 wildfires and about 4.7 million acres burned average annually. So it's different, right? Clearly the Northeast states are, we have a much different fire context than the Western states and the Southern states do. And part of me says that the, the numbers themselves don't quite tell the entire story. Um, to broaden that out, uh, and I'll, I'll be honest, I am biased uh, <laughs> uh, to wildfire. Um, unlike the Southeast, uh, our seasons are often limited by a long cold winter. Um, unlike the West, we have a dominant uh, land ownership being private land ownership in the Northeast. And on top of that, we have about 40% of the population in the Northeast as well. Um, from a Minnesota perspective, we, we don't usually have a large, long, impactful fire season. We don't have an annual loss of structures. But again, from my bias point of view, we have a lot of potential in Minnesota. But that long, cold winter combined with, you know, land at 10,000 lakes, all those things are difficult. People interpret that for themselves. And that determines what time, energy, and money that they might dedicate into taking care of their landscape, taking care of their structures. Um, if you go to the next one, John, there it is. You can see this is a uh, this is right out of uh, uh, a, a uh, the program that Larry mentioned earlier. Inform this shows you the number of fires in Minnesota um, to date this year. This is a few days old, maybe a week old, so it's not quite entirely up to to the exactly to the day kind of thing. But you can kind of see a general pattern that forms and kind of matches that pattern on the uh, the map we were looking at initially. Center part of the state has a lot of the numbers of wildfires. The northwest part of the state has the largest wildfires traditionally anyway. Um, in states or in United states, in uh, years like this, uh, if you go to the uh, the next one again, John, but we have, um, well, this is actually a more of an average fire season for us here in Minnesota, but you can see from, from this, most of that wildfire period is, is contained between March, April, and May, about 76, almost 77% of all of our wildfires and more than 80% of our acres burn in those three month windows, that three month window. So we have a, a very active, somewhat short, it can carry into the summer. You can see we have fires and acres in every month of the year, um, but for the most part it's contained within those three months of the year. Um, so given all those factors, 10,000 lakes, long cold winter, it's tough to get people, um, fire is not necessarily a driver. We've had people actually ask us, uh, they were unaware Minnesota still had wildfires. I contribute that to just good fire prevention. Uh, might be biased, um, but it is challenging uh, to get folks to engage, to manage their forests, manage the fuel loads, manage their properties, um, to do what uh, we need to do. To really address wildfire issues in a meaningful way, we need to have uh, a broader level of vegetation and fuels management on landscape scales uh, on private lands if possible. Uh, and again, it's a tough sell. Um, next slide, John. So uh, I'll talk more about the programs I manage uh, here on the next slide. For a variety of reasons, what I manage, we focus mostly on that 100 feet surrounding structures. Um, another good way to reduce uh, fire threats, fire uh, risk, is to reduce the fuel loads uh, across the more broad level landscapes. If you keep the fuels down, you reduce the intensity of wildfires and have a chance to uh, reduce that intensity as a fire threatens a structure. So th this image shows, uh, a project up in the Arrowhead of Minnesota, up in Northeast Minnesota, uh, through the Arrowhead Forest Partnership. Uh, funding for this project came from the NRCS, uh, matched by resources from the five conservation districts serving Cook, Lake, St. Louis, and Carleton counties, those counties up in the Northeast part of the state. 
uh, project started uh, about three years ago uh, and focused primarily on spruce budworm outbreak uh, that's been happening up in that part of the state. So you, you can see from the two photos on the left here, the before and after, before on the left, after on the right. Uh, so the beginnings of, uh, uh, there you go, uh, the beginnings of uh, uh, what it looked like before and what it looks like after, as you can see a significantly reduced amount of uh, dead balsam fir on that property in St. Louis County. Uh, reports were that the landowner was very happy with the results and actually has uh, some additional properties or some initial pieces that are also going to need some, uh, some treatments as well. Um, and that's kind of demonstrated by the, uh, the picture on the right. You can see the, the buildup of fuels in that picture there. Um, the graph, the table in this slide is a little tough to see. I understand that, but just generally that is uh, detailing some work done by foresters from those five districts, about 335 conservation practices. Um, Soil and Water Conservation District staff, NRCS staff, along with DNR forestry programs like Sustainable Forestry Initiatives, uh, work together to implement forest projects uh, and practices in those areas. Uh, you can see from the, uh, the quote at the bottom from uh, Lauren, working together on a landscape basis is essential. Uh, wind, water, and wildfires do not know any of those uh, political boundaries that we have on them. Um, this is a great example of partners that come together uh, with private landowners to manage woodlands. And projects like this are, like I said, a great opportunity to do that. The local folks, uh, much like, I believe, much like politics, um, firewise and fire uh, mitigation is local. Um, and so I think this is a great opportunity for uh, a project where conservation districts could jump in on. Um, next slide, please. So this is more on uh, what we do in my program. Uh, we call it the fire prevention program, but it's a firewise and risk, a wildfire risk reduction program overall. Um, we focus again on what's referred to as the home ignition zone, that closest 100 feet within structures. Um, our primary goal is to help property owners that, that live in these areas to recognize that, that there is a responsibility for living in a flammable environment. We try to teach them how to minimize those opportunities for fire to threaten their homes and to help them understand that it's a shared benefit. What they do on their home uh, benefits those around them as well. Uh, Minnesota currently has 18 community wildfire protection plans in place. You can see that from the map on the left there that shows where they're located, primarily the northeast and the north central part of Minnesota, although we're pushing those out to uh, further areas. Uh, our preference has been to build CWPPs on a county scale. I think there's some benefits that you gain by having a, on a large scale like that, although we have done them at smaller scale as well. Um, Regardless, again, I think this is an, uh, a great opportunity for conservation districts to become a new partner if they aren't already in working on and updating community wildfire protection plans. Uh, we've, much like you've heard already this morning, we've, we've taken the approach that the more locally driven these plans are, the more they will be received, the more they will be implemented, the more they will be updated versus, you know, I come in from St. Paul and give you a three ring binder that goes on a shelf and, and there it sits. So local driven is, is great. Um, the center of the map, you can see all the dots on the on the on Itasca County in the center of the orange area. Uh, those represent firewise communities. Um, at one point, Itasca County held the honor of being the fifth most active firewise county in the country, um, and that's saying something. That there's some stiff competition. There's some really strong firewise counties in the West. Um, that's another great potential partnership in the making, I think, to recover and maintain those firewise communities. I know Megan or one of our other speakers is going to talk more about firewise later, so I won't dig into that a whole lot here other than to mention, this is another local driven community effort that could benefit with more partners. Um, we also work with the center map here, shows our recently updated firewise in the classroom project. And with that project, we work with mostly high school juniors and seniors to do a, a real course assessment of communities uh, houses in their area and based on the results of that assessment by high school students and there's also some firewise and prevention things that we teach them as we go uh, based on that we then work with um, uh, local fire departments in the area to address what we identify as high risk areas within an area to do a more fine-tuned uh, assessment of homes in that areas and there's also some firewise um, fire mitigation uh, learning and, ex and education that goes along with that so Minnesota Adopt Firewise, uh, I honestly don't know how many years ago, for a long time it is and it's going to continue to be one of our big uh, uh, outreach efforts that we use across the state of Minnesota. And so I know where we are uh, short on time and I have a tendency to talk long. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, John. Thanks, Casey. Yeah, I got, I got three more slides here before we get to Dan. So for the sake of time, I am just going to rip through these and just say briefly on each one. 
So this slide here is just provide more context of, of the ownership patterns here in Minnesota. Generally speaking, um, you know, as you move north, we get more pressure for converting private lands to ag and also developing private lands um, for recreation. Um, in forest land ownership here in Minnesota, we have about 17 million acres and family forests own 41% of that, which is 8 million. Um, and like I said, so the private lands is where the risk is. You have development, agriculture, and also you know, timber harvesting for economies is very important. And that's where the decrease in timber harvesting has been on private lands as well. So if we can increase forest management, <laughs> forest, we can address both. Of those issues. Um, and we also have um, two landscape scale restoration grants with the U.S. Forest Service. We've had um, over five million dollars of grants um, recently to, to help implement these. And the, the conservation districts are one of the primary uh, fiscal agents from that where we allocate the money towards. So real quick overview there. Um, with that, Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Can you hear me all right? Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, welcome, welcome to the land of 10,000 lakes. Water is a big issue here, and it's a key resource for Minnesota as well. After all, uh, we are the land of 10,000 lakes. We're also the headwaters of the mighty Mississippi River, plus the Great Lakes, which is the world's largest freshwater source, starts here in Minnesota as well. We're a, We're a continental divide state three times over, with flows going east to the Atlantic, south to the Gulf of Mexico, and north to Hudson's Bay. Water is even in our name, Minnesota. So water quality has given us a critical platform to grow private forest management. Our best fishing lakes occur in the poorest parts of the state, northern Minnesota, by and large. That's, That's no accident. accident. These, These lakes, lakes have the best water quality in the most intact native fish communities. So right from the start, forest and watersheds make the difference. That's a key theme of what we're doing here in the state and how we're bringing together the longstanding DNR's PFM program with the Board of Water and Soil Resources Watershed Planning Programs. And those two um, are working in much closer coordination. Next slide, please. We've connected watersheds and private forest management through the minor watersheds and RAC, we'll get to that, our AQ scoring methodology that several of us have developed with districts in the state. The great news is that through this water quality connection, we built an effective collaborative infrastructure to deliver forest management services to private landowners at landscape scales. It's through our partnership with conservation districts and consulting foresters, as well as other partners and NGOs, that we can best increase PFM service delivery. Protect the sponge, you can see that comment here on the slide on the right, um, that was made by Pete Jacobson, a long time DNR uh, fisheries research uh, scientist here in Minnesota. And it really kind of sums it up. Uh, it's a very simple but profound connection uh, the effect that uh, forests and watersheds have on receiving waters. Next slide, please. So is there a tipping point for watershed disturbance? In other words, how much can we open up a watershed or develop it, be that agricultural or subdivisions or commercial or whatever it might be, how much development or deforestation can a watershed take before its phosphorus discharge starts to spike? And so this slide here shows all those dots in the triangle on the left are uh, fish lakes and fishing lakes in Minnesota. There's 1,200 of them shown in this particular study. It took decades to develop this database. Um, and then the colors on the left correspond to the colors in the map of the state on the right. And then with the uh, upper Mississippi River Basin is, is uh, delineated by that dark line the map on the right. And so you can see here the sweet spot is the light green. The light green color lakes are those that uh, still have good water quality but do not have 75% protected forest watersheds. So the lakes in the upper corner of that triangle, the dark green area, uh, in the northeastern part of the state, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area and so on, those have excellent water quality and are have more than 75% protected forest watersheds. 
Whereas, Whereas in, in the prairie, prairie part of the state, you can see the impairments grow quickly into the yellow and red, where we've got impaired waters, many of them uh, because of excessive nutrient and, and runoff. So the sweet spot is at 25%. That's what uh, the research found, that it when you reach about 25% deforestation or, or development in a watershed, that's where phosphorus really starts to take off and water quality starts to go with it rapidly. Next slide, please. So here, this slide just shows programmatically um, how we're integrating PFM, uh, a DNR program with local water planning, a program with the Board of Water and Soil Resources. And by bringing those two together, we can see in the, in the box uh, uh, statement there in the lower part of the screen, priority watersheds, uh, identified through the water planning process and targeted parcels, that's through the RAC scoring process, RAQ, plus the PFM toolbox, that's just what are the tools that are available for landowners to uh, work on their properties with, and then plus landowner choice equals what we call precision forest conservation for multiple benefits or a return on investment. Um, next slide, please. So what is an LSP? A la LSP is a landscape stewardship program. And here you can see, or I'm sorry, a landscape stewardship plan. And here you can see in the uh, uh, cover of the Pine River Watershed uh, LSP, this, uh, the Pine River is located right in the center of Minnesota. And you can see here, we have a very uh, short process. We, we meet about three times over about four or five months and we have a simple three-part process, analysis and content, then the middle, a vision, goal one, which revolves around forest land protection, goal two, around promoting forest stewardship, and then part three, how to make it happen, coordination and implementation. So that's what a landscape stewardship plan is. These tend to be about, oh, between 30 and 40 pages in length. And again, the idea is to get them developed as quickly as we can. These are then front-ended into the watershed planning process, which then follows. So it's like a whole bunch of, of good uh, forestry information that uh, is intended to influence the watershed plan, especially as you can see in the photo, many of these watersheds are heavily forested. Next slide, please. Uh, state, state policy direction, we have the conservation referendum in Minnesota, which is producing funds for conservation projects. Um, one of the main directions that's come from the legislature is PTM, prioritize, uh, target, and measure. But that's how uh, we, they want agencies and other partners to um, think about uh, uh, identifying priority projects. And so... We, we prioritize by water. That is, we let perhaps a, an outstanding lake would draw us to a particular uh, part of a watershed. And um, then we target by land, and, we, and that's the RAC process. RAQ, uh, we'll get into that a little bit in the next slide, where we then um, sort through the various parcels in that watershed and, and decide on, on priorities. And then we measure by needle. We're usually measuring uh, progress by acres, and so we have a simple metric there that's really helpful, and we can put that on a thermometer or a uh, tachometer like this, and we move the needle toward protection, which, if possible, will be that 75% forest protection goal. That's not possible to meet in all watersheds. Some watersheds, you can only get to 65%, let's see. Well, then the goal would be to move towards 65%. So you can see the priority minor watersheds here in the colors on the upper of the two maps on the slide. This is the Bemidji to Grand Rapids area of north central Minnesota, the Mississippi headwaters of the headwaters, you might say. And so the priority watersheds there are those in uh, orange and yellow. And, and the uh, watersheds that are already at 75% are shown in green. Then we, and the other map there, you can see now we're changing scale and we're moving into uh, a parcel analysis uh, of, of uh, where priorities might be uh, first pursued in that map on the right. And that's our RAC process. Next slide, please, John. Dan, you just have a few more minutes.
So yes, you know. thank, thank you. So, so here, here we can just see um, the map, map on the left shows the the Lake Ada, Ada minor watershed. watershed. The, the map, map on the right, right and this particular minor watershed, watershed, the thermometer in the middle shows it at 72% protection. So we only need 400 more acres of protection, forest protection in this watershed to reach our goal. And then the map on the right shows now those pars private parcels have been scored and ranked as to uh, which probably provide the highest uh, public benefit. The orange color and red being the highest public benefit. So it's an extremely uh, useful uh, tool for storing uh, parcels. Next slide, please. This just shows we can provide a landowner's uh, spreadsheet for each of the districts working on implementation. So this serves in effect as a uh, tailor-made work plan for districts and they can figure out which landowners have uh, probably the highest public benefit parcels and uh, which ones are the larger uh, landowners with larger parcels where we can reach our goal uh, more, more quickly. quickly. Next, Next slide. slide. One, One success story we'll look at real quickly is this is on the Mississippi River, um, about 150 miles upstream from the Twin Cities. In this particular minor watershed, you can see on the map on the right, uh, it started at 37% protected lands. Uh, there was uh, fee title acquisitions are those two green spots you see on the map. Those moved the needle from 37 to 46%. One, One of those went to the state, state of Minnesota, Minnesota as the adjacent landowner. The other went to uh, Kerwin County, County, County because the county owned adjacent land. So those were fee title acquisitions. Uh, conservation easement is the pink area you see in the upper right. Um, that was a 2017 conservation easement that moved the needle another five clicks. And then uh, the gold parcel there um, in the north end, that was a... Uh, uh, SFIA, Sustainable Forest Incentives Act Covenant, Covenant Project that uh, moved the needle uh, together from 37 to 71% in just two years. So, so this shows us that uh, landowners like this full toolbox and that you can never tell exactly which um, particular tool landowner is going to want to run with, but uh, it's been very encouraging to see this kind of receptivity. Next slide. So this is my last slide and it just shows kind of um, what it's all about. It's all about stacking public benefits, we think, or return on investment. I think you're going to hear more tomorrow about the ACUB program at Camp Ripley. And that's a military training facility in the center part of the state. So we start at the bottom with, in this case, the military was providing funding because they want to protect these bases from uh, residential encroachment. And, and uh, uh, but it also happens to be in the Morrison County Comprehensive Land Use Plan that they want to preserve the rural character of the county. So you can see that in yellow. But we're doing protecting outstanding wildlife habitat because we're right on the Mississippi Flyway. It's a great red shouldered hawk area and neotropical songbird migration route. And then, and then a source, source water. water, of course, the, the, the Twin Cities draws its drinking water supply from the Mississippi. So we're getting we're delivering source water protection benefits. Uh, Fish habitat, perhaps the best smallmouth uh, fishery in the state of Minnesota is the Mississippi River in the central part of the state, also outstanding musky fishery. And so we're protecting fish habitat and there's public access uh, at multiple points along the river so that the public can enjoy the use of these uh, referendum conservation tax dollars going to work in the state of Minnesota. And so it's about stacking public benefits, we think. Return on investment. Districts are a huge key player. They're fundamental. They're interfaced with the landowners, along with private forest consultants. They're very important. Um, they do the real work. We just try to help them uh, be successful. So with that, I think um, I'll close my comments. So with that, uh, thank you. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. I was just saying yeah. for the sake of time, we'll just we'll just go ahead and end it right there. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. And again, uh, for Minnesotans, as we look at our forestry activity, we have a very comprehensive and rigorous approach that engages local government, as well as state government, as well as federal government. We're in this together collectively. And what I want to lead at the end of the day with you is 
We take the science and the expertise of some of the agencies, and yet we know we need to work with those landowners. So you have this beautiful infrastructure of local conservation districts that are tied to both federal, state, and local. So again, thank you, John. Thank you, Casey. And thank you, Dan. And so at this time, then what we'd like to do is segue into fire preparedness with conservation districts. And again, I have the pleasure and honor of introducing the Minnesota State Fire Marshal Division, Amanda Swenson, who is our Chief Deputy State Fire Marshal, and Bob uh, Reif with the Deputy State Fire Marshal, Fire and Life Safety Officer, and John Earhart, Supervisor in Eastern Area Technical T2 Incident Management Team Member. So take it away, and we welcome you. Thank you today for being here. Thank you, and just to give you a quick overview um, about the State Fire Marshal's office. I just wanted to go into, you know, what we do as a State Fire Marshal division. Um, and this does vary state by state. And so while this is very specific to Minnesota and what we do in our State Fire Marshal division, um, there's certainly um, variation across the country, but overall very much focused on fostering a fire safe environment um, in every state. And so how that plays out in different fire marshals office um, and what exactly they do um, does vary. But for us, a lot of what we do comes straight from Minnesota state statute and often from large scale incidents of the past. And then it becomes legislation um, to help us prevent those type of incidents from happening again. And so we initially were founded on investigation, which is what most people probably know our office for, is um, seeing on the news a large incident and then being investigated by the State Fire Marshal Division, which really gives us information about prevention and how we can change things in the future. And so we work on training, fire code inspection, but a really large portion of what we do is connecting with our 775 fire departments across the state to give them resources, tools, and connection with our office so we can help to support them. And so we also have a whole team dedicated to getting out to the fire service um, and helping them make connections between our office as well as their local communities. And so this um, certainly was a great opportunity for us to jump into those connections and try to see how we can also link in so that we can be um, helpful in the communities and making um, our communities safer from wildfire um, in connection with our partners over in the DNR, which we also, you know, really enjoy working with. Um, and just wanted to give you a snapshot of the fire service here in Minnesota. And so this is just a snapshot of what our fire responses were in 2019. We're finalizing our 2020 data. Um, so uh, from our 775 fire departments, this is how many incidents they responded to. And so our fire departments have that jurisdiction on um, structural protection, but again, we'll work closely with the DNR in wildland. Um, sometimes they might, the local fire department might be the um, first responding agency or the only responding agency depending on the incident in the wildland area. And so again, working with them closely on how we can prevent and things that we can do to kind of make our communities safer. And so this is where I hand it off to Bob because um, he is one of our frontline staff really working to connect with those fire departments and then connecting out into the community. So Bob, take it away. All right, everybody got me on audio. I'm trying to get my camera going here. I think I, I think we got it. All right, you know I, when I when I came on board um, with the State Fire Marshal Division, I came from a, an almost 19 year background as a suppression firefighter who dealt mainly with structure fires, and so for the most part, I always looked at things through that particular lens. And with the exception of a couple of wildland fires that were closer to the urban area, I was never involved in, in dealing with those fires. But the couple of times that I did, I very quickly gained a whole new respect for people who have to deal with wildland fires. That said, if I can resort to a, 
a very commonly used metaphor these days, and pardon me if it seems a bit cliche, but you know, when we work with other agencies, uh, we've always been very cautious out of respect for those agencies to try to stay within our particular swim lane. But as time has gone on, and I hope as we proceed into the future that we start thinking a little bit less in terms of swim lanes and start to recognize that we're all in the same pool. I go back to some of the opening comments that were made by, by Chris French, who talked about, you know, these concerns are nationwide and, uh, and certainly they're very evident here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, six or eight years ago, I went to some um, wildland urban interface training and I remember the members of the two local departments with which I had and still have a connection were wondering why I was going to, to WUI training. But I could already begin to see that even as we got close to the seven county metro area of Minneapolis and St. Paul that um, as suburbs began to expand to exurbs and began to go out beyond that, that there were developers that were building significant number of homes in areas that had been woodland and, and even marshland areas. And I could see that it was going to be, uh, you know, pretty imminent that some of those places would likely be impacted by fires that were started in some of those forested areas and can certainly extend to the structures. Now what I've seen in the last year with the, the pandemic that's hit um, is an interesting phenomenon and I don't have hard data to show you about this, but, but here's my concern. We've seen a, a significant urban exodus as people began to home office and then as they began to recognize that there were some areas in greater Minnesota out in the outer areas of Minnesota where they now had broadband capabilities and could do their work from home in those areas, <clears throat> A lot of them were buying residential properties or even cabins and cottages that they then converted to year round living um, residences, sold their places in the metropolitan and urban areas of Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, Rochester, and went out state. But these are not people who are used to, I'll call it country living. They are not people who ever had reason to be concerned about fire adaptive community and about hardening their properties. And so I'm, I'm concerned that folks that are now in some of those areas uh, and, and even developers who have been contracted to go in and carve out an area in some of the, the woodlands of Minnesota really don't have that in the forefront of their consciousness as they make those moves. Um, recently, I attended a chief's meeting in Northwestern Minnesota. There were 54 departments represented there. Um, at, sometime after that, I met with the fire chiefs up in Cook County and later in Carleton County, again, all in the Northwestern, Northeastern, the so-called Arrowhead parts of the state. And when I brought up my concerns about folks that are going out into those areas for the first time, um, both people who were paying for the properties to be built and, and some of the builders, I saw those chiefs around the table without, almost without exception, nodding their heads and saying, oh boy, are we ever seeing that up here? Chief, if you'd go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So as part of our you know, mission statement that you saw earlier, I mean, I'm all about that. Now, a couple of the speakers brought some of these statistics up earlier in the, this morning's conference. And so I don't need, know that I need to dwell on those. But uh, again, just the sheer number of fires that you see in the various identified regions of the United States, uh, to me, that was a little bit staggering. And again, coming from a background as a structural firefighter and one and two local um, fire departments, I never really had um, a sense of, of the tremendous scope of the fire risk that's uh, in this state and nationally and, and regionally in our northeastern region. Chief, you can go ahead and go to the next one if you would, please. <clears throat> I, I look outside my window, I'm in my beautiful home office in my basement where um, my wife chooses to lock me in here during the day so that she has free reign of the rest of the house. But as I look out my window and up above the galvanized steel of my, um, <clears throat> my egress window, I can see the, the weather that we've got here today. And, and you know, like, like any of you in your states, in Minnesota, we always joke that, you know, if you don't like the weather in Minnesota, wait 20 minutes. 
Yesterday, we had almost torrential rains at various times in my part of the state here. And now I look out the window to see some blue sky and some bright sun, but also got a warning from FEMA about the fact that um, our relative humidity has dropped below 25%. We're expecting temperatures to rise into the upper 80s. And we've got 20 mile an hour sustained winds that are gusting to 40 miles an hour through much of the state today. So all of those areas that have undergone a recent green up, um, you go through a day or two like this with the hot, windy weather, and those places are going to dry out, and, uh, and that fuel load is going to become that much more volatile. Uh, and some of those marshland areas are going to turn into, you know, tinder for all practical purposes. So um, we need to be concerned about the changing weather conditions as well. Chief, if you'd uh, go to the next slide for me, please. Again, just more statistical things. And, and although you can see that in the southern area, there's been a drop in terms of the going below the 10 year average. But if you look in the eastern area up at the top, you can see that there's been a 38% increase um, in wildfires versus a, a typical average season over the last 10 year period. So it's happening more frequently. And whether you choose to attribute that to uh, natural causes with a changing climate or with human causes and, and the fact that there are more and more humans inhabiting some of our forested areas or a combination of those things. The fact that they are in increasing in frequency is, is uh, unquestionable. Chief, please, the next slide. Again, that just uh, emphasizes the things I was just talking about. And I'm, again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead and ask the chief to jump to the next slide. So I think all of us that are, that are here today, I realize I'm preaching to the choir. We all have an opportunity to um, to do more in the way of prevention and mitigation. But my concern and my position with the state really is to try to hit the prevention. So I think it's time for, for me anyway, and for all of us in our respective agencies to de-silo a little bit and understand that our relationship and our lines of communication among agencies, I think is absolutely crucial as is public education. And again, as, as things have begun to open up a little bit, as, as more of us um, and as all of us in our state fire marshal division have become vaccinated, we're finally getting a chance to get out in the state and meet face to face with fire chiefs and fire educators, with folks from the DNR, with folks from the Forestry Service, um, folks from the, the BIA. <clears throat> and at least in, in Minnesota, in Minnesota, because I'm going to talk about a very, you know, developing a personal relationship with people within those agencies is absolutely critical to effective communication. Having gone out and now tried to meet with the chiefs in the areas that I represent, and my concern is from Interstate 94, which is roughly in the middle of Minnesota as it crosses the state all the way to the Canadian border. It's one thing for me to push out <clears throat> public education messages or, or things that I think might be helpful to chiefs and educators to try to get some more public outreach for them to share their knowledge and expertise of fire ad adaptive communities and hardening you know, private land properties. Um, it's one thing for me to send all that information out digitally to folks, but I know that in the busy lives that they have, especially with so many paid on call departments within our state and the fire service, that that can easily get lost in the shuffle. But I'm a firm believer that once you establish uh, even minimally a personal relationship and they've met you, you've had a, an opportunity to shake hands or do a fist bump with somebody in this COVID era, that when I continue to communicate with them and emails come across their, their, their monitors or across their laptops with my name attached to it in the state fire marshal division, I think they're much more likely to, to read whatever I've sent out. The other thing that's been, been good for me is that up in Cook County, up near in the Arrowhead area of, of Minnesota, up in Grand Marais, when I met with the chiefs up there, I, I developed a couple of those relationships that have already paid off. This afternoon, I have a phone, I have a phone conversation scheduled with the emergency manager up in that area, Mike Keyport. Um, also, um, thanks to, to Aaron Milkey up in that area, who also works for the DNR. Uh, I am now attending the monthly Firewise meetings of uh, the folks up in Cook County. And again, I don't know that that would have happened until I established those relationships and made a pitch for the notion that we're all in this, we're all in the same pool together. Our goal is to, to prevent fires and mitigate them once they happen. Chief, if you'd go to the next slide for me, please. 
Oh, I guess that was my last one. So I'll, I'll wrap up by saying this. Um, Tom Crow earlier talked about the importance of, well, there we go. Um, he talked about the importance of, of educating folks, educating interagency education. Already this morning, just from listening to the presenters that preceded me, I have already increased my knowledge of a lot of this stuff tenfold easily. And I'd, I'd like to have you know, that kind of ongoing education going forward. And I also think it's important that the public gets educated, especially in Minnesota, we've got so much of that land that's privately owned. I have to find ways to get through to those landowners with, with information that can help them to become fire safe, to manage their properties more effectively, and, and to understand that we're all in this together. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn this over to John Arrett um, and with, with the experience that he's had both on a state, regional, and national level, I think he's going to, to really bring this stuff to, to light. So John, I'll turn this over to you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Bob. You do an awesome job as always. My name is John Arrett and I'm with the Minnesota State Fire Marshal Division. I serve as a supervisor for a team that um, oversees the emergency teams, special teams in our state. Um, in addition, um, our state fire marshal has allowed me to be part of the Eastern Area Incident Management Team, which covers the exact area that we're talking about here today. Um, I do need to put in this little brief um, uh, comment, though, that my comments do not represent the Eastern Area Incident Management Team. I'm a team member there. And uh, I serve as a, with the command staff, as a liaison officer. So what I am hopeful to share is state fire marshal information, but also uh, some of the observations that I've had over the 10 years working on the, uh, on a large scale incident management team. I'm also, as of recently, I used to be on a type one national team out of the Great Basin, and uh, now I'm regular with uh, the Eastern Area Gold Team. So one of the things that I would like to first start off by saying is that um, our local fire departments are typically the first ones in. And they're the ones that are faced with that photo that you're seeing here on your slide. Um, they're often the first ones in, and they are oftentimes that supporting mechanism that allows the forest and statewide agencies to actually deal with fire attack. So one of the things that I'd like to highlight is that, for example, in this fire sitting here, which was in East Tawas, Michigan, uh, we just got back from that fire. It started here in April. We were there for a week and a half uh, as, a, as an overhead team. But what we've discovered with time is that if there are any stressors within an organization and a community, um, an incident will magnify uh, the stressors in that relationship. Oftentimes overhead teams when we come in are given the challenge to enhance or make relationships as good or better in the future. Well, if they're severely damaged before we get there, um, you can imagine how that feels when we are asked to help make things better. Uh, one of the things that we've discovered, that I've personally discovered in my role as a liaison officer, is that I'm oftentimes seeing a gap between what we hope is true versus what reality is. There's normally a very big disconnect between uh, what the general public sees as being um, uh, management skills of the forest and of the land versus their expectations. And again, as I share above here in those relationships, if there's anything that is uh, not clear to the public, it is magnified during these incidents. A couple of examples here, fuel reduction and management. Um, as you guys so well know, oftentimes the public has varied viewpoints on that. It's an educational opportunity. Prescribed burns. Some agree with them, some don't. Uh, we oftentimes will hear the challenge between harvesting of timber and the challenges of recreation, tourism, and employment. This plays out time and time again when a large scale wild, wildfire happens. And oftentimes it's somebody like me that ends up having to manage that uh, when an actual disaster does hit. Next slide, Chief. 
Uh, one of the things that uh, this photograph here, by the way, was taken of um, uh, a wildfire here in the state of Minnesota, which our team was part of. Um, 100,000 acres blew through the boundary waters. That's a pyrocumulus cloud here in the state of Minnesota. We don't often see that here, but we're beginning to see those across the eastern area when we go out. Um, this here storm threw 100,000 acres in about a day, which is unheard of. Even when we travel out west, we typically don't see fires blossoming to that magnitude in such a short period of time. Oftentimes in communities, they don't understand the concepts of ready, set, go. And those are the, the uh, plans in place that when a fire is blowing into a community and a team does come in to help and assist, uh, we operate on those basic principles. And when a team uh, comes in and the community is not prepared for ready, set, go concepts, it becomes very difficult to work with local law enforcement and the local fire departments with evacuation plans. Our evacuation plans are critical at any point, as you can well imagine, during a wildfire. And I put in a bullet here called contingency plans because so often our plans include best case scenarios, but oftentimes when we come in on these large scale events, we oftentimes at the road, we discover the roads that they had anticipated being open were either closed during due to construction or perhaps the fire was coming in from a different direction. Next slide, please. Uh, we also fully endorse the ideas and the concepts of firewise conversations. Again, it's about those relationships happening before wildfire strikes your community. Working with your local fire departments on access, gaining access to their structures is key and critical. We were on an incident not too long ago and a gentleman uh, really very, very upset with our team. He said, do you, uh, you managed to save my, uh, my house, but all the forest has gone all around it. And um, he said, why did you bother saving it? And um, our answer, of course, is that that's the mission that, that we all signed up for. But one of the things that was a takeaway for our team afterwards was that he really could have done us all a, a job. And I should say it this way. I have to be careful on it. Um, his structure was not firewise in any way, shape or form. And I know our structure protection specialist spent a lot of time to save his, his building there, even though he did zero preparation up front. So I think sometimes when a community and property owners uh, actually do take care of their properties, allowing access and allowing an opportunity for um, the fire departments to get in there for structure protection, that's a big sign that says, hey, save me. And the other ones where they actually take zero measures makes it uh, almost a sign to say, you know what, I, I don't care about my property nor should you. Not saying that's the approach we should take, but that's what it says. Um, but it's working with the fire departments on property identification. And then in closing here, working with the fire departments on a water supply. Uh, this photograph here was again taken in the state of Minnesota in Grand Marais. This is a 150,000 acre fire that uh, we didn't like it. So we sent it to Canada. And on the back end of it, the Canadians kicked it back into the United States. Um, 140 structures were lost on this fire. Next slide, Chief. So doing your homework up front, this is a conversation dealing with structure protection. Um, this is a conversation in the emergency meeting that we had during Pagami Creek. We quickly discovered that um, if your roadmaps don't run in concert with the U.S. Forest Service, the county, or the city, those are opportunities to start taking a look at it now. Because when we come in and we start pushing out maps and say, um, we're going to be working on Wilson Road, the Federal Forest Service sees it as 179. So making sure your plans run in concert. And finally here, it's running and making sure that your comms plan with radios but maybe more importantly, relationships are solid prior to that large incident. Next slide, Chief. That's all I have. Um, turn it back to our, our Chief Deputy. And I'm gonna throw it back to 
to Anne, but really thank you for having the State Fire Marshal's Office as a part of this conversation. Very great topic for us. Thank you I just want much. to make a and just to add to the closing comments, again, Casey, Dan, Bob, John, and John, I think what I'm looking at, and I think, Bob, you hit it well, we're in this pool together, and we've got different driving forces and policies and legislation and missions, but collectively, we look at where is that win-win, and having everybody bring that expertise at a local level is key. So I just want to applaud you, and thank you for bringing that expertise to all of us. Thank you. I agree 100%, Leanne. Thank you to all the speakers. I, I really enjoyed what, what you shared with us and all the details. What I've done during the presentations and, and um, you know, we've eaten up the time for the Q&A, but I've written some questions down and um, actions as well. Each of the speakers had recommendations within their presentations that I will be including in a desk guide for conservation districts to help them understand and implement the goals of the cohesive strategy. So that'll be a resource guide for everybody. And it, it touches on what I think each one of you said where, you know, it, it's time to get out of the silos. That was really the premise and the foundation of developing this cohesive strategy, which is the, in the long name, it was, it was very important to every one of the, the co-authors that we put cohesive in there because it was about getting out of the swim lanes. It was about working and developing those relationships early. The fires, the floods, the wind events, the damage to the landscape is well beyond any particular jurisdiction. And it, it is way past time that we engage early and engage at all levels. And I really have come up with some ideas and, and building off of the actions that the speakers talked about in this session. So um, before moving on to uh, the next panel, I do want to call out one thing, John, I really appreciated uh, Eric, what you had talked about with, you represent the, the Northeast uh, part with, with your efforts. And we, we have a fabulous response organization in this country. And the folks up in the Northeast are often the folks that are helping out the West and the Southeast with any type of events or national, whether it's, you know, uh, hurricanes or flooding coming into Houston or, or wherever it might be, you know, um, I, I, I just really think it's important that we highlight that, uh, you know, we have a great forest fire compact uh, alliance in the country. And so states to state uh, relationships allow for the moving of people and airplanes and, and such that is, I, I think, second to none. Um, would you agree with that, John? We have a robust system that sits out there. The trouble that we're seeing across the country, though, is that with the large numbers of wildfire that are happening, uh, the teams are being taxed greater than they ever used to be in the past. Um, for example, this past year, I spent, uh, I can't tell you how many days out in California, in Oregon. The year before, I spent a month up in Alaska on a large-scale fire up there. So, Teams are moving across the United States. And uh, um, I, I got to tell you this, I applaud your efforts because it's something's got to change. But there's not enough teams out there. Great. Thank you so much, John. Thank and you. I, and I don't want to move on without mentioning, I think Gail Kantek is on here and she's one of the very active members in, uh, in the Alliance and the Forest Fire Compacts um, from the Northeast. And um, I, I, her work is, is phenomenal with pulling people together. Um, with that, thank you again to all the folks that were on that panel.